Genesis 29, verses 21 through 25. Jacob said unto Laban, Give me my wife, for my days are fulfilled that I may go in unto her. Laban gathered together all the men of the place and made a feast. And it came to pass in the evening that he took Leah his daughter and brought her to him, and he went in unto her. And Laban gave unto his daughter Le Leah Zilpha, his maid, for a handmaid. And it came to pass that in the morning, behold, it was Leah. And he said to Laban, What is this thou hast done unto me? Did not I serve thee for Rachel? Wherefore then hast thou beguiled me? I don't know right now if you can hook this together. But hopefully by the time I finish preaching, you'll get your head wrapped around what I'm saying. I'm preaching tonight God's unexpected Christmas gifts. God's unexpected gifts. Christmas gifts. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm <clears throat> going to have to start clear back at the beginning because um, it was the first day of the week after the completion of the week of creation. God had worked seven days and he rested on the seventh. What I want to tell you is we have no idea how long the creative days were up through day four. But certainly day four was a very, very long day because just now the Hubble telescope is finding stars and galaxies that are over 900 billion light years away and their light is just now getting to us. So for it to travel 900 billion light years, it had to start shining 900 billion light years ago. What makes you say that, Brother Harper? Well, it was on day four. We have no idea how long that day was, but it evidently was very long. On that day is when that he created the sun, the moon, the stars, and he gave them to us that we would be able to have signs, years, seasons, months, and days. And I want to tell you about his clock. That's the day that time started. Before there, there was no time, but that's when time started. And what I'm going to tell you about time is this. God is not in time. Time is inside of God. God stands on the outside of time, and He knows everything that's going on in it because He's declared the end from the beginning. And what I will tell you, that that clock that He started on that day still works the same today. 365 and a quarter days every year is what it takes for us to pass from zenith to zenith. And that's just the way that it is. That's the reason we have four, three, 400, 365 days. And on that fourth year, we have 366 days so that we catch up with that quarter day that transpires. And so what we know is this, is, is that what we do know is the Bible went on to say that once that clock started, he said a day with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is as a day. So what you've got to understand then is that it looks like that probably day five of creation, day six of creation, and day seven of creation were probably 1,000 years long each. Now, he rested on the seventh, meaning that Adam and Eve had a thousand years to live in the Garden of Eden. And so after the end of that thousand years, God showed up on Sunday the first day of the week. And when he did, he came looking for Adam and Eve, and Adam and Eve in the course, can you imagine this? On the day of rest, they got to messing around, and they ate the food of the forbidden fruit of the tree, and so all of a sudden the glory of God had left them, and they were standing there naked. And so he came into the garden looking for them, and he said, where are you, Adam? And then Adam said, we've hid ourselves because we're naked. And so what took place then was that they were driven from that paradise. And when they left that estate of paradise, they were cast down into the world. And we're still working for it right now. I shook Tim's hand the other day, and I felt calluses on it. 
thank Adam and Eve for those calluses. That's the reason, because he, he sent us out to labor among the thorns and the thistles, and that's what put us out here in the world where we are. But when he did that, not only that, but he told the woman that she would have sorrow in childbearing. Now, you young women that are just now getting ready to expect children, I want to tell you, the sorrow and the pain of childbearing is just not getting them in this world. When they're little, they say they walk on your feet. When they get older, they walk on your heart. And you're, you, you're signed on to responsibility that you're going to have to give attention to as long as you're alive. You'll give attention to your children, your grandchildren, and maybe even your great-grandchildren if you're fortunate enough to live that long to the fourth generation. But what I want to tell you is this. He said something else to the woman. He made a promise to the woman and said, Woman, you're going to bear seed, and your seed is going to bruise the head of the serpent, and the serpent is going to bruise the heel of your seed. So, from then on, the genealogies began. Then this man with the name of Adam and Eve, the son that lived in the blessings of God, was Seth. There were genealogies from Seth to Noah. Then there was genealogies from Noah to Abraham. And then, of course, you know there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then a prophecy came to Jacob as he spoke a blessing over Judah. And that was, that the preacher even mentioned that uh, this past Friday night. And that was that he said, The scepter shall not pass from Judah until Shiloh come. And that was the completion. So it was that it was going to be found in Judah. All right? It's obvious now from the story that I just read at the beginning that this man, Jacob, was totally shocked. He was shocked because when morning comes and the light comes up, he hadn't been patting on the cheek of Leah or of Rachel. He'd been patting on the, leak, the, the cheek of Leah. And uh, she was not the most attractive girl in town. In fact, the Bible said she was tender-eyed. She had eye trouble. And, uh, but here's the thing that was frustrating to Jacob. He had done everything in his power to bring about his goals and to make his plans for the future work. But now suddenly, on daybreak after his wedding, he wakes up to the fact he's got a brand new dilemma on his hands and it's fouled up all his plans. He's now a husband, and immediately he is faced with a mountain to climb. This is not beautiful Rachel that he bargained for. So what in the world is he going to do? Every now and then, it's good that you have unanswered prayers. But I want to tell you something. If you have unanswered prayers and your plans fail, the first thing I want to tell you tonight is life's not over. Failed prayers and failed plans, life's not over. In fact, first loves can break your heart. Don't despair. I've got a dear friend, lives not far from here. He just told me four days ago. He said, Brother Harper, said, I'm going to tell you what. He said, when I was a young man, I dated the most gorgeous girl you could ever date. We got engaged. I gave her a ring. We had our wedding all planned. We had all that stuff bought that you're going to put in your first house. And he said, would you believe one week before that we were to get married, she run off with another man? Well, he said, after she run off, though, said, I met this beautiful, lovely lady, blossomed into a wonderful wife and mother. He said, we just celebrated 53 years together. He said, but not very many days ago, he said, I saw the girl that run off and left me said she was a big blob of blubber and as ugly as sin. And I walked out and raised my hands and said, Thank God for unanswered prayers. But I'm going to tell you something about life. I want to tell you that every promotion that you get in life, it doesn't matter what kind of promotion you get, when you get there, there's going to be a giant in there for you to conquer. Here was the man who had worked his days. He got a wife, but he had something to conquer. In fact, one fellow said it like this. 
with every new level in God, you got a new devil to fight. I want to tell you something. We talk about David and his sling all the time. What I want you to know is this, is David needed Goliath in his life. He needed Goliath in his life because it allowed his faith to surface. It allowed his courage to surface. It allowed his ability to surface. It allowed him to show the people that by faith you can be a winner. He was more than a minstrel. He was more than a writer of poetry. He was a warrior that God had put in the land and the only way that everybody could discover the call of God in his place was to put a giant in his world. So here's what I want to tell you. God gives you dreams. I don't know if you've had dreams, but I have dreams. And I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about pizza dreams or, or beans and cornbread and onion dreams. I'm talking about that imagination of the things I want to do, the places I want to go, the things I'd like to accomplish. Well, you see, here's Joseph. Joseph had a dream. In his dream, he saw the sun, the moon, and the stars, saw them bow down to him. He, he, he saw the, the sheaves in the field and saw the sheaves bow down to him. You know, here's what I want to tell you about dreams in front of God. Anything that you dream, are y'all tuned in to me? Anything that you dream that you can accomplish without the help of God, God didn't give it to you. You see, the, the thing about Joseph was this. He went from favorite son to the hated brother. He went from the hated brother to the pit. He went from the pit to slavery. He went from the slavery to prison. But there's something about hanging on. If you've got a giant to climb and you can stay faithful to God, finally he went from the prison house to the throne. Yes. Hallelujah. You see... Battles and challenges uncover the champion that's in you. If you're doing something for God or for anything, if you can pay for it without God, your dream's not big enough. If you can get it done without God's help, you're not dreaming big enough because God doesn't dream in little minuscule things. God dreams in mountaintop discoveries. You see, when you're in the will of God and the purpose of God, every situation that God allows in your life will bring you a situation, and that situation will point you to Jesus. In fact, this whole thing is about revealing Jesus. In the book of Genesis, he's the promised redeemer. In the book of Exodus, he's the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the high priest. In Numbers, he's water in the desert. In Deuteronomy, he becomes the curse for us. In Joshua, he's the commander of the army of the Lord. In Judges, he delivers us from injustice. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In 1 Samuel, he's prophet, king, and priest. In 2 Samuel, he's the king of grace and love. In 1 Kings, he's the ruler greater than Solomon. In 2 Kings, he's the powerful prophet. In Chronicles, he's the son of David that is coming to rule and the king who reigns eternally. In Ezra, he's the priest proclaiming freedom. In Nehemiah, he's the one that restores what's broken down. Everything in life ought to point you back to Jesus Christ. When it comes to Esther and Job, the mediator. In Psalms, he's the shepherd in the valley. In Proverbs, he's our wisdom. In Ecclesiastes, he's our meaning for life. In the Song of Solomon, he's the author of the faithful. He's the lily of the valley. He's the bridegroom that's coming to have a church. All of these things in Scripture point out who he is. I want to tell you what. Everything ought to point him out to you. I said everything ought to point him out to you. I'll tell you this. He's coming again. I said, you hear me? He's coming again. When you get to the book of Revelation, he's king of kings. He's Lord of lords. He's the alpha. He's the omega. Come on. He's the beginning. He's the end. He's the first and last. He is he that was and that is and that is to come. He is the almighty. You see, the reason Jesus puts things in your life to let you recognize who he is is because the Bible says that the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy. You see, everybody say, Jesus is. Jesus. Say it again. Jesus. Jesus is Abel's sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram. He's Isaac's well. He's Jacob's ladder. 
He's Judah's scepter. He's Moses' rod. He's Elijah's mantle. He's Elisha's staff. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Samuel's horn of oil. He's David's slingshot. Isaiah's fig. Hezekiah's sundial. Peter's shadow. Paul's handkerchief. Stephen's signs and water. He is, and he's coming back. Do you hear what I'm telling you? He is, and he's coming back. He is the mighty God, and he's coming back. He's wonderful. He's counselor. He's the mighty God, the everlasting Father. He's coming back, and he's coming back for his church. I'm going to tell you something else. He's not coming back for a fledgling church, but he's coming back for a triumphant church who knows they are in Jesus. That church is going to be blessed, victorious, empowered, anointed, proven, moving, knowing what the power of God is. Let me just stop and tell you that the day that we're living in, regardless what challenges that we're faced with, this is our day. He saves the best for last. You know what the story of the birthright is in Israel. When a child was born in Israel, he was automatically given a promise of two-thirds of the inheritance. When he got that promise of two-thirds of inheritance, it looked like that the others were left out. But I'm here to tell you something. When it comes to the manifestation of the will of God, God's secret's in the second born. The first Adam was the earth earthly. But he didn't have anything like what the second Adam was going to have. Y'all still with me? You see, there was Cain. There was Abel. If you want an old-fashioned hill talk, there was Cain't and Abel make you able to do it. Yeah, here's what I want to tell you. Cain't is always lurking in the corner to try to steal your ability from you. But you go ahead and do what God asks you to do, and he'll honor Abel's sacrifice every time, and the resistance of Cain will go the other way. You say, Abel is accepted. And the reason Abel's accepted is this. I want you to say this with me. I can do all things through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Would you raise your hands and praise God? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Abraham's firstborn was Ishmael. But that wasn't where the promise was. The promise went to his secondborn, Isaac. The man by the name of Esau had the birthright. He had two-thirds of all of it, but he squandered it away, and Jacob ended up with all the blessing. Let me tell you something about your life. It's that second born that's what makes the difference. The first part of your life, you may erect it. You may have messed it up royal. But can I tell you something? If you'll give your heart to Jesus Christ, you can have the second part of your life can be very successful. There was a man by the name of Saul. Saul, they called him king, but my, 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 he, he, he screwed up royal. And then there came along that second one. His name was David. And David was going to be the one of whose kingdom there would be no end. And eventually it would be Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You can't beat it, ladies and gentlemen. It's not the firstborn, it's the secondborn. Elijah had seven miracles. Elisha had 14. It's not old Jerusalem I'm going to. I'm going to New Jerusalem. I'm here to tell you something. My great joy and strength didn't come from the first time I was born, from Ruth and James Harper. My great things came when I was born from Jesus Christ. When I was born again. Hallelujah. I'm here to tell you that God saves the best for last. Remember I said that there will be a Goliath in your life? Well, I'm going to tell you when he shows up, don't despair. Fear factor ought to drive you to your knees. The fear factor ought to drive you to fasting and prayer. You see, there is where that he makes us able. The author of the story of your life is God Almighty. And he's taken this book that he's written for you, 
You see, he declared the end from the beginning. So he's taken this book that he's written for you, and now he has made you an actor on the stage of life. And now you're performing out your life. Well, God, as the writer, because he loves you, he always writes himself into our lives. God will never omit himself in any plan that he calls you to do. Turn to somebody close to you and say, you got a plan? Well, let me just stop and say this. If you want to make God laugh, make a plan. Because whatever plan you've got, ladies and gentlemen, God is there to control it. And I want you to know something. If he's not there, it's because we choose to keep him out of our lives. But I'll tell you what he's saying right now. He's saying, I have a beautiful ending to your life. So if you will allow me, I'll tell you to arrive with it. And the circumstances will depend upon you whether you're going to follow me or not. You want to know why? Shout this with me. For without him, you can do nothing. I got to have Jesus in my life, whatever I'm doing. Hallelujah. In fact, you're sitting in this very facility. A lot of people compliment it. But I want you to know, God gave me what you're sitting in. In fact, I drew 15 pages of blueprints, full scale, and drew them to scale. And I took them down to the building inspector to get the building permit. And he said, oh, no, we can't accept these blueprints. They don't have an architect seal on them. Okay, my first mountain was to raise $23,000 to pay an architect who literally copied to the line every piece of architecture paper that I'd presented to him. When he gave them back to me, he had made two changes. When we got ready to build the building, the two changes that he made wouldn't work, and the man that was working here had to change them back so it would work. You got to climb mountains. That's, that's not all. You see, when I got down to the zoning people, they looked at me with kind of a chuckle. They said, in guy and dot. No, it's too tall. It's too big for the property. There's not enough parking space. But what he didn't know is God had already set some things in place that when I faced those problems, there was other answers coming. I slipped over to a man's office by the name of Bobby Nelson. I had been a friend to him. I'd always spoken to him as your honor. I'd gone out and eat with him. He'd talk to me. But I walked in that day, and I didn't say, Mr. Mayor, I said, uh, Bobby, I need to talk to you. He looked up at me, and he said, well, preacher, come on in. Now, the first time I went to see him, it took me six weeks to get an appointment to see him. I'm going to tell you why it took six weeks to get an appointment. They had, they had brought, uh, what was those four guys that had those hideous faces and bit chickens' heads off. And Kiss. They brought Kiss down to the Civic Center. When they did, many of the churches in town, they got together with placards and everything, and they marched around the Civic Center protesting Kiss being here. He said, when I finally got an appointment with him, he said, all right, preacher, you're here. What have I done to upset you? I said, uh, Mr. Mayor, you have not misset me at all. I said, I'm the new pastor up on Staunton Street. And I said, uh, I've uh, got a wife, three children to raise in this city. I understand there's some challenges here. And I want to ask you, Mr. Mayor, what do you want me to do to help you to make this a better place to live? He leaned back in his chair. He called for his secretary to come in. He said, I want somebody else to hear this besides me. I've never had a preacher to walk into a political entity and ask me what they can do to help me. So I repeated it again. Well, he ended up, he did ask me a couple things to do. I did perform. I did them for him. I got some permission to put a 
to put a park somewhere in the city, and they lit it up and turned it into basketball courts, and it was a nice place, but there were some people there that didn't want, that uh, didn't, didn't see eye to eye with it. But, it. but I went as an ombudsman, and I helped them out. But that built a relationship with that mayor. And when I told him that, and, and uh, here's the thing, he started coming to this church. He came for 14 years and didn't miss a Sunday. Didn't miss a Sunday. God love his heart. When he got a little older and couldn't get around as well, he had to choose someplace much closer. But I understood that. But I, what I will tell you is this, is that he picked up the phone and he called the people that were in charge and you're sitting in a miracle. You're sitting in a miracle. Too tall, too big, yeah, not enough parking space, but here it is. And I want you to know something. God brings the dreams to pass that's too big for you to handle. God doesn't come on a silver platter. He doesn't send your answer on a silver platter. It doesn't come that way. It comes through fasting, comes through prayer, and I'm going to tell you what it also comes through is downright old hard work. And even though before the physical activity begins, God writes your story that so when it's over, you will know this, that it's not the work of a man, that a man doesn't get credit for it. What you're going to see is you're going to see something that God did. So you'll step back and look at it and say, to God be the glory. To God be the glory. I'm telling you that that's why that Romans 8 and 28 says this, for we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are called according to His purpose. It's not those that think. It's not those that wonder. It's not those that say maybe. But when he said it, he said all things. I'm going to tell you something. If you love God, and if you love God, wave your hand at me right now. If you love God, shout hallelujah. If you love God, say I love you, Jesus. If you love God, and if you're involved in God's purposes and God's plan, I want to tell you right now, victory is on its way. I said victory is on its way. Trust God. Yes, trust in the Lord, Proverbs 3 and 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto your own understanding. In life, there are positives and there are negatives. But you know what? If everything in life is positive, the, the light bulb won't shine. If everything in your life is negative, the light bulb won't shine. But if you have positive and negative as a balance in your life, then ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to tell you something. It'll turn on the light. God wants us to have a balanced life. He wants us to have spirit and He wants us to have truth. He wants us to do it in decency and in order. But He wants us not to be afraid to follow the direction that God gives us. It's not just some things. I stood that couple here this morning and I, I want you to remember this comes with living for God. You need to live for God for better, for worse. You need to live for God for richer, for poor. You need to live for God in sickness and in health. You need to make up your mind to, to, to live for God till death do us part. And then when it comes time for you to go, you're going to really start living. All things are for our good and for His living. That's the reason He said, all things work together for good. Jacob, don't despair. Life's not over, son. Keep on dreaming. Uh, I remember Dad, the day before I took him to the hospital for the last time. You know what Daddy was talking about doing? He was telling me how he wanted to build one more house. Well, I think he's built it. I said, I think he's built it. He's built it where the mansions outshine the sun. 
In fact, I, I remember just two or three days before Brother Kitchen passed away, I was sitting talking to him. You know what we talked about? He talked about another sermon he had a thought to preach. He talked to me about another revival he felt like this church was going to have. He talked to me about wanting to take another trip and go where and see something. I want you to know something. If you're going to end this life, then end this life reaching for the future. Don't end this life mullet grubbing. Get God into your plans and keep Him there. If you want to make God laugh, make a plan. But whatever you do, say, God, whatever my plan is, I know that you know what's best for me, and I'll take whatever you give me. If God ever changes your plan, He does it to bring you something greater. You know, in life, people's pledges can fail. I've had no less than four people come to me and tell me how they were going to write checks and pay this church off. We're behind you, preacher. And now they're so far behind me, I can't even see them. But God, but God doesn't arrange things to make them easy. God arranges things to give Him glory. And the end results are going to prove that God's in control. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. An awful lot about our dreams will come to pass in your children. Think about mom and dad, brother and sister kitchen. And then I think about my life and sister Harper's life. The faithfulness of our parents have brought blessings to our lives that without their lives, we wouldn't even know what it is to have this blessing. And I want you to know, each level of victory, it will seem like the zenith. It'll seem like, man, it can't get any better than this. I just got something to tell you. Don't stop with that victory. Back up and take a breath because if it's good today, it's better tomorrow. There's a better day coming. See, here he is. We, we're blessed by something. We're blessed by the children of a hundred-year-old Abraham. And Sarah, she was barren. And at 90, she birthed Isaac. You, you can't make God's will work with human manipulation. Abraham tried to do it with Hagar. Sarah tried to do it with Hagar. And did you know that 14 years went by after that fiasco with Hagar before ever God spoke to Abraham again? 14 years of silence went by. So, but when God did speak again, well, you do know that in most ball games there's four quarters, except in bas college basketball there's only first half and second half. In high school basketball there's four quarters. Football there's four quarters. Baseball there's nine innings. What I want to tell you is this. The game is not won in the first quarter. The game is won in the fourth quarter. And let me, let me tell you about as you mature. Talking to you like this, I, when you were young, you had a lot of vim and vigor. And young people, whatever strength you've got, use it for God. Because it's good to worship God in the days of your youth. Good to serve Him. And, uh, but, but older folks, let me speak to you. You're smarter now. You've been educated by life. You are as young, though, as your latest dream. Never throw away your old treasures. Hang on to them. Life is made up of old and new. It's a mixture of what we have. Don't throw away your old money, because I want to tell you something. Antiques have value, have a value that can't be duplicated. I'll tell you a true story about my wife. She, uh, she wanted a uh, sideboard, uh, what do they call those things, sideboard. And so that's the thing you set at the end of the dining room and you set all your plates and stuff for serving center. So I was feeling benevolent, so I went out to Value City and I found a bargain, 100 and, 
$15. I brought it home to her. Thank you very much. So I'm out of town now. And I come in, out of town, and as I come in, Jim Meyer and Danielle come pull it up in an S10 pickup truck I had. In the back of it, they had this grotesque looking thing. And so I said to my wife, what is that? Oh, I went to an estate sale today. And they wanted more for it, but I bargained it down to $150. So I, I, I took the sideboard back that you got me, and this just cost you $35. <laughs> I said, Sharon, that is the ugliest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yes, it was big. It was massive. But it was painted, and I don't mean to sound grotesque, but the only way I can tell you what it looked like painted was it was painted vomit green. <laughs> I made her feel bad enough that she started crying. So you got to heal the wound. So I went upstairs and I found my secret hiding place. I found her a little bit of money. I brought it down and gave it to her and I said, uh, why don't you take this and get it refinished? So she called around and found out there was a gentleman from Pakistan down on 14th Street. So I took it down to him. He said he would be glad to, he'd be glad to work on it. Told me how much it'd be. Had enough money for that to do it. So we went to work on it. And then, of course, she is a lady that likes to match things up. And uh, that's the reason we have these colors that blend like they do across the church. So she said, take this drawer out of this china cabinet and take it down there and tell him that you want him to finish it like this drawer, which is like an antique white trimmed in gold, you know, a couple pastels on it. So I take it down there and I say, now this is the way she wants it finished. He looked at me with his Pakistani English accent. He said, dear man, you do not want to finish this piece of furniture with that. And I said, well, this is what she wants. She does not understand. I have stripped down a piece of furniture that is solid walnut. And he said, I have checked it out. This was made before 1765, somewhere in Connecticut. He said, come, I'll show you something. And he took me in, Liz. He opened the book up, and he said, just the, the, the current value of the pieces for me to rebuild this, and I can't build it back like this is, he said, would cost me over $4,500 just for the material. This was years ago. And I said, really, is it that valuable? He said, sir, you have an antique that right now, he said, there's collectors all over America would give anything to have it. <laughs> We're doing better now. So after he finishes it, I went down to pick it up and I called him by name and I said, would you care to tell me how much you think this is worth? He said, only God knows what it's worth. And so it's sitting at the end of her dining room today. And she even had me to build a special alcove for it. I'm not kidding. And I said, well, should I insure it? He said, do not insure it for less than $25,000. What I'm telling you is this the antique, the years behind you. Nobody can put a price on what your knowledge and your experiences are worth. Your life of tomorrow is built on what God has brought through you. And listen, don't throw away anything, young people. You keep remembering what it is to be in church. 
You remember the shouting. You remember the songs. You remember the worship. You remember the preaching. You remember the teaching. You remember the songs that you sing. I'm going to tell you why. You are building something that is so valuable. It can't be duplicated. You can't duplicate the furniture. We can't duplicate the cars. But I'm going to tell you something. The Bible says those that are planted in the Lord are like a tree planted by the water. And they're going to bear fruit beyond measure. Hallelujah. Don't let anybody count you out. I don't care what quarter of life you're in. Samson's greatest victory came in the fourth quarter. He overcome his enemies with the help of youth. It was a young man that guided him. It was young men that put his hands on the pillar there in that, that ungodly pagan temple. You want to know something? There is such strength in historical power. I, I don't mean to overplay my wife or embarrass her, but I'm going to tell you something. Whenever that I see her, put her eye on somebody in that audience, take off her shoes, and come down off the platform and head for them. If they need the Holy Ghost, I'm going to tell you, nine chances out of ten, they're going to get the Holy Ghost when she gets through with them. I've seen her crawl across pews to get to them. I've seen her go down and wrap her arms around them. What is that? I'm going to tell you what it is. It's years of experience in the house of God. It's a prayer life that doesn't just happen here in the house of God. It happens at the house at midnight at 2 and 3 in the morning. It's what it's built on. When I look across this audience and I see sister, brother, brother and sister Scarberry back there and I see her get happy, it helps me. Oh, it helps me. When I see you older saints worship God, Sister Debbie Clary, go ahead and do your war dance. Praise God. Doug Hickman got to watching her do her war dance, and he learned to duplicate it. That's where Doug Hickman learned to shout, was watching Debbie Clary shout and magnify God. Don't you be afraid to magnify God. Don't you be afraid to set your goals high. Don't you be afraid to give in to the things of God, because God's going to use you. Hallelujah. You see, the happiest people on earth are grateful people. People that do it. Life has struggles, but God has built victory into the struggle. You learn from failures. In fact, I'm going to tell you something. You will learn more from your failures than you learn from your victories. You hear what I'm telling you. So don't throw away what you've learned. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord. And life's journey, we don't understand it. But the greatest lessons you learn are not taught in a classroom. The courses in the classroom don't teach it. I'll tell you where you learn your best lessons is walking on the course of life from day to day on your way to your destiny. Things got changed on Jacob. Got changed severely. Some of you older guys, some of you younger guys might remember this name. But uh, his name was Kareem Adul Jabbar. Anybody remember that name? I'm, I used to be six foot one. I shrunk. Doctors told me I shrunk. I told him he didn't know what he was talking about. I told him I was getting taller. He said, no, you're not. Right here. Stand up here. I want to measure again and show you. You're, I said, no, that, that's not right. I'm getting taller. He said, why would you say that? I said, it's getting farther from my seat to my feet all the time. <laughs> but Kareem, when my day I was six foot one, Jabbar was seven foot and two inches tall. That's a tall man. But because of his height, the NCAA, for 10 years, outlawed dunking the basketball in competition because they said that his height gave his team a disadvantage. You'd think that'd be disappointed to him. But what happened was that is he developed a shot that was called the sky hook. And his shot, the sky hook, Brother Chester, produced more points 
for a player than any other single shot used by any other player in NCAA history to this day. He didn't dunk it. He just always did what basketball players like Brother Koontz would want him to do. <laughs> Me too. What are you telling us? They put a roadblock in front of him. But the roadblock only became the initiative for him to find a better way to do it. Just because you run into a roadblock, that doesn't mean that it's over. And every now and when you get into a situation that's bigger and tougher than you are, you know what you need? You need a little sky hook. You need a little help from above. Our God in heaven's looking down. He's got some good things for us. And we just don't. And I'm going to tell you what. When you get in trouble, a good look up is a good hook up. I want you to know, stay in touch with God. Fasting and prayer reveals what God can do for you. The advantage that God gives you, you discover it in life. You know, I, I started driving on the farm. We had an old 54 model, one ton Ford stake body. It had a four speed transmission. First gear was what they called a mule gear. I want you to know something, you could hook that old truck on about anything in that first gear and you could pull the bumper off of it and whatever you was pulling, Brother Allen. It was just so powerful. And you know, as young people sitting down here tonight, you're in your youth, you're in your first gear of life. And in your first gear of life, you've got all kind of energy and you've got all kind of power. And as you move on, Lord, you'll move into second gear, third gear. But I'm in fourth gear now. I'm cruising. Yeah. I want you to know I'm cruising. What I want to tell you is something like this. First gear is your power. The Bible says young men for war and old men for counsel. And it's mighty important. Whatever stage of life you're in, don't be backed in a corner because something's not going the way you planned it. Back up and say, God, now what are you going to do? And watch him do it. I said, and watch him do it. Did you ever hear of the bow weevil? Everybody got to have a home. Even the bow weevil's got to have a home. Back in uh, 1910, the boll weevil migrated out of Mexico into Texas. Then, by the year of 1915, it was consuming cotton fields all over Alabama. In fact, that year, because of the boll weevil, they lost 60% of their crops. Because of what had happened, there was farmer after farmer after farmer that was bankrupt. And then in the midst of all this fear, there comes a man out of the corner by the name of George Washington Carver. George Washington Carver was a former slave, but he became the South's foremost agriculture innovator that was ever known. And he came out and he said this, I know a plant that the bow weevil's not interested in. And they said, Mr. Carver, what's that? He said, they don't like peanuts. So he began to, he talked them in, and Theodore Roosevelt got on board, and they talked those farmers into just trying it. And so one year, they plowed the ground, and they planted peanuts. In their first harvest, they reaped more production and more finances in their first reaping of peanuts than they had with years of raising the cotton. What I want to tell you something. Every now and then, God sends a bow weevil into your life. Don't you be worried about it. You just back up because somewhere God's got an answer. The Lord's ways are better than our ways. His ways are as high above our head as the heavens is the earth. You just believe me to tell you this. How many of you have heard of Nathaniel Hawthorne? 
Nathaniel Hawthorne was a man that lived back in the 1800s. And he used to be a, he used to have a political job. And he uh, worked in the custom house. And uh, so presidents changed, political parties changed. And so they walked in one day and they fired Nathaniel Hawthorne in 1849. He went home and for the next week, he went out of the house just like he was going to work. Because he didn't have the courage to tell his wife he'd lost the job. Because in his thinking, the first thing she was going to do, well, what did you do to lose your job? That's what he expected. But he finally mustered up enough courage and he walked in and he looked at his wife, Sophia, and he said to her, I've lost my job. She said, really? He said, yeah, the political climate changed. And they walked in and terminated me. She said, good. He said, good. He said, she said, Nathaniel, I know you're a genius. And what I want to tell you is this. It's now time for you to write the book you've always wanted to write. He looked at her and said, well, how are we going to live? Let me tell you something. She was a wise woman. In fact, that's what the word Sophia means. It means wisdom. She was a wise woman. And she said to him, she said, well, she walked over and pulled a drawer out and there were stacks of money in there that she had saved because every time he would give her house money to run the house on, she'd peeled off a little bit and saved it. She had enough money for them to live for a year. And in 1850, there was published the Scarlet Letter. And it changed their life completely. Just listen at me tell you something. I want you to hear me. There is someone, if you please, that's a very wise wife. And she's about to show you how to have a miracle. It's called the church. She is the wise wife of the Lord Jesus Christ. She sees a better future for you. And the greatest change and reversals happen through the church. We're on our way and it was when we were on our way, we're in trouble. But when we really get right is we get on His way. We once were tangled in confusion, but now we have been set free from the torment of sin. The church points you to salvation through Jesus Christ. What a Christmas gift, if you please, when Jesus took our place and removed all the evidence of guilt against us, saving the best for last. The best is when you're born again. He who knew no sin became sin for us, took our place, the Lamb from the foundation of the world. I was the reason, that one earthly reason. I was the guilty. He was the sacrifice. I was the taker. He was the giver. Dying while I go free, that one earthly reason was me. And I was guilty with nothing to say, and they were coming to take me away. Then a voice from heaven was heard, which said, Turn him loose and take me instead. A crown of thorns, a spear in his side. Oh, the pain that have should have been of mine. Those rusty nails were meant for me, yet Christ took them and let me go free. And I should have been crucified. I should have suffered and died. I should have hung on the cross in disgrace, but Jesus, God's Son, took my place. Let me finish Jacob's story. What looked like a great disappointment to Jacob turned out very different. He lived his life. Rachel died young. But this woman by the name of Leah gave him six sons. And when he decided to be buried, he asked to be buried right beside Leah. She gave him six children. But the greatest of those children that she gave him was a son by the name of Judah. And out of Judah is where that the Lord Jesus Christ came from. God had a plan from the first day out of the garden. And he fulfilled that plan. But in order to fulfill the plan, 
He had to wreck Jacob's plan so that you and I could have life and have it for eternal. Jacob didn't understand at the time, but God had a surprise. God had an unexpected Christmas gift for us because Leah was in the tent instead of Rachel. Trust in the Lord. Say that. With all thine heart. And lean not unto thine own understanding. Twenty, twenty-three is a coming. Do not approach that new year passively. Dream your dreams. And dream the kind of dreams that you know you can't do by yourself. And let God get involved in your world. And God will direct your path if you'll trust in Him. How many of you want to make heaven? If you've never repented of your sins, come tonight. If you've been going through a battle and you need some help from on high, it's time for you to get a hookup, a sky hook. Get in touch with heaven. Make up your mind you're going to let him walk with you. Don't let the bow weevil quip you. It may be a black man by the name of George Washington Carver come along, but you let them bring you the kind of hope that you need. I want you to know something. This apostolic message is God's work. You won't read this in liturgy because we're not a form of religion. The last thing we want is we don't want a form of religion that denies the power of God. We want to be able to worship, to shout, to magnify God and take advantage of the Christmas season and just be thankful that Jesus Christ from the tribe of Judah came to give us life and to give it more abundantly. Praise God. Would you stand with me while the singers come? I want you to gather at this altar and bring whatever challenges you've got. Bring them to this altar. And as you bring them, come, reach out to God. Reach out to one another. Let God direct your paths. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. While they're singing, it's your responsibility to pray. Pray for one another. Minister to one another. Somebody out there might have a need. Help them to find their answer in prayer. That's right. In Jesus' name. Don't be afraid to pray out loud. Don't be afraid to pray out loud. Hallelujah. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Just pray. Seek His face. Hallelujah.
That's it. Start praying for one another. All over the building, start praying for one another. That's right. Women pray for women. Men pray for men. 